Matt Van Dyke, welcome to the Pace Performance Podcast. Thank you for giving up some time to uh, have a little chat. Thanks for having me. Thanks, mate. For someone so young, or certainly looks so young, <laughs> you've done a lot. You've done a lot. You've done a lot. Author, publisher, uh, articles, blogs. Oh, and obviously the role of Texans now. So congratulations on all that. Thank you. Thank you. Probably look younger than I feel most days. <laughs> For anyone that doesn't know who you are, Matt, would you be able to give us a bit of a, an intro on your on your background and maybe talk a little bit about all the stuff that I've mentioned as well? Yeah, absolutely. Um, for me, um, it, it definitely started young. I think I was about 11 or so, and I got a weight set um, for, for Christmas. So I was really fortunate. Um, I had a, a younger brother who's eight years younger than me. So as I grew up loving training, he was really athletic. So I got to train him along the way and learn a lot about that. And then the other piece, obviously been really fortunate to be surrounded by some incredible coaches along my journey, had a lot of stops. Um, and it, and it kind of started with, uh, my mom had always told me based on that weight set that I would be involved in athletics to some extent. She was like, you're going to be a coach, a referee, somehow you're going to be involved in that. And, um, when I got to Iowa state, I was a freshman and I walked onto the football team um, and it was my first day in the weight room and our head strength coach was Yanti McKnight. And it, it was literally like I walked in and I was like, oh, this is it. This is this is what I want to do. Like getting to see um, high level training for athletes with with the intent of changing their performance on the field. Um, that was really enticing to me. So like I think it was literally that day I went and changed my major. I was kind of a PT major at that point, like pre PT. And I was like, I want to switch into the. The, the human performance, slightly different track for courses. Um, but yeah, so I was at Iowa State for four and a half years, um, getting to experience as a player some of the training programs that an athlete's go, like an athlete could potentially go through. Um, and then at the end of those four and a half years, it, it was, um, I was getting ready to graduate and one of the uh, assistants there suggested popping up, seeing Cal Dietz um, and triphasic training. So went up to a, a conference up there, ended up Um, obviously spending some significant time with Cal, but interned for him for uh, two summers while I was getting my master's, um, ended up working full time for him. And that was that was an incredible experience for me as well, is because in my master's program, we were only we only had I think it was me plus four other students along with two advisors. And so oh, wow. Cal really respected the advisors that we had from a biomechanics and an exercise physiology standpoint. So Cal was asking them questions from the adaptation side, like trying to get their brain on the best ways to go about his system at the time. And obviously he'd already done triphasic and all those things, but but always trying to get better. And then on the flip side, he was giving me the practical. So I kind of got to sit in between some of those conversations. That that was a a great learning experience for me. And then obviously went on, um, worked full-time for Cal for, I think it was a grand total of six months. And he kind of looked at me and he was like, all right, you got to get out of here. You got to run your own system. Like you've seen this stuff. Um, Time, Not not to kick me out the door, but he was like, "Go, (laughs) go do your thing. And so I ended up at the University of Denver um, head, head strength coach for six teams there, the director, Matt Shaw. And again, really fortunate to be surrounded by some incredible, incredible people. That's where I got to meet, uh, Dr. Nick Studholm. Um, and he runs a system called FNOR that's uh, functional neuro orthopedic rehabilitation. And up to that point, obviously I'd had my experience with triphasic and Cal now getting to implement it with the six teams that I had there my first year. Um, but Nick added a, a, a new level of, looking at an athlete from a different lens of not just necessarily strength, power, speed, but okay, let's look at them from a movement standpoint and how are we evaluating how they're moving and how, what are the aspects that we can implement that are going to create change in their movement. And so that was a huge piece, like an introduction to gait. Like if we always look at it, if they can't do it when they're walking from a joint angle um, at certain phases of gait, how could we ask them to have that ability when they're running or sprinting? And so that was a huge, a huge connection that I still talk with Nick probably almost every day, um, discussing different concepts. How can we make some of these pieces fit? Um, was at Denver for two and a half years. It was one of those things where I thought, uh, classic young coach, I was like, oh, I could be here forever. I could, I could live in, I could live in Denver. Denver is a great city. 
um, and ended up visiting Texas to speak at a conference. And in the meantime, Yancey and a lot of his staff had moved um, to the University of Texas. And while I was there, a, a position opened up and, and it ended up um, going through the process and, and getting that job. And that was the moment where my role transitioned to more of this sports science. Um, and so it was handling all the GPS testing, if, if we're going to do um, force plate measures, the Nord board, um, movement screening, um, anything, again, trying to look at that athlete from the holistic lens. And that, that was a, a, a huge opportunity for me to, obviously, we, we've used pieces of it at, at Denver and Summit, Minnesota, uh, but I was getting to run a lot of it. And so opportunity to handle, like, return to play baselines. How are we, again, applying all of those systems and processes that I learned in the past from Cal, from Nick, from Matt in Denver, and now, and obviously Yancey back when I was in college, so sliding back into that system and helping coaches plan training camp practices with this is how much time we should spend on the field. Um, just all aspects considered of of athlete performance at that point. And so that was a really cool opportunity. And, and naturally, and in, in, in the same fashion, I was like, Oh, I, Austin's a great city. Like I could spend some significant time here. And then out of the blue, get a call from the, the strength coach here at the Houston Texans, uh, Mike Eubanks. And, and he's like, Hey, can you, can you come down for an interview? Um, we're, we're looking at a, at, a, at this sports science role. And so obviously, COVID last year was a was a whirlwind in terms of learning a new system, move transitioning into the uh, NFL setting where there's different rules, different allocations of time. You don't have the entire year to train the athletes, but it's been incredible to be part of this sports performance team. So I kind of sit in the middle of strength and conditioning, Mike Eubanks and his staff, sports medicine, Roland Ramirez and his staff, and then um, Lad Harris and nutrition and wellness. And then we're also helping as a group, this team of teams, helping coaches and providing the, from my perspective, the, the best insight that we have available from the testing and monitoring into athlete availability to our coaches and our management. So we're looking at, I mean, practice management, testing and monitoring, helping out any way that we can. And then obviously um, fitting all of those systems that we've learned in the past and fitting those into a new context and in the new setting that that is the NFL because it's it's a different monster when you're looking at that testing and monitoring and so that's been an incredible experience to take all of those previous experiences um, whether it's looking at some of the more individualized warm-ups that you'll see um, from a nervous system standpoint and all like all the way into the triphasic system. And, and Mike especially has been incredible um, a, allowing and, and fitting um, that system into what he was already doing. And, and I think we've made some, some incredible um, progress in this system. I'll say that in terms of what you have available from, a, from an NFL standpoint and, and getting the most from our athletes, but also turning around and making sure that they're prepared at a high level day in and day out. Was this a new role, Matt? Was this a this sports science role, or was yeah, it, it was taken over they, from someone else? They had somebody kind of splitting the time before between some S and C and sports science, um, but then they they kind of realized that it's it's a bigger role um, with with all of the new technology that's coming out of how we can dig deeper in everything that we're doing with that management. And la and question around your playing, do you how, how much of influence? did you have as a coach was based on your experiences as an athlete? Do you think that really helps? And the reason I ask is it comes up all the time in conversation, especially with football, sorry, soccer guys who have been players and then transitioning to sports science or strength and conditioning roles. And their take is that it really helps them with the, um, just the communication and the understanding of what these guys are going through. How much was that applicable to you? Yeah, it, it's it's funny you say that it is it's almost it's not surprising because we've been in sport enough at this point but it, it is interesting how much as soon as it like you can talk to these guys day in and day out but as soon as they hear that and obviously I never played to any level that these guys have played at uh, but when 
when they hear that, oh, you've kind of gone through something similar, like, oh, I like Mike and I still do all of the training programs that we provide our athletes. And obviously we're, we're older at this point than pretty much (laughs) everybody, but you kind of got, I mean, I I hate to say this, but the old man strength kind of kicks in where it's like, okay, I've trained in the weight room significantly for what, 12, 15 years at this point. And so it's, it's how can we, um, create that buy-in. And I, and I think that that's bigger than people give it credit for, because even, Mm -hmm. even this week, um, like Iowa and Iowa state, it's a big rivalry, obviously in state, there's no pro sports in, in Iowa. And so it's a huge thing. And we've got a couple players from the university of Iowa playing for us. And so we kind of joke back and forth on it, like, like what's going to happen. And so it does, it, it, if nothing else, it creates a new connection that you can have with that athlete that just like we're looking at things from a new lens, from a holistic standpoint, I think that athlete looks back on you with a, with a new lens. So I want to thank you as well for writing your recent article for Sportsmith. So thank you. Thank you for that. That's gone down a dream as, as we all, uh, as we all knew it would. Can you give an insight into the decisions that go through your mind and the minds of your or staff when it comes to testing and monitoring? How do you choose? There's so many options available. You've named a couple just before, GPS, Nordboard, uh, Force Plates. We could, the list could go on and on. But how do you guys decide what to test and then not only what to test, but what metrics to evaluate within those tests? Yeah, I think I think that's a huge question. And that, and that first article is definitely, it's more of, evaluating you as a a sports scientist or you as a staff of what you value rather than it is even the athlete, because you've got to have a system within this testing and process, like system and process of testing sports performance, all of those aspects. And I would say that understanding that the context of it is king. So understanding what aspects do we feel one are valuable linking to on-field performance and and we all completely understand that an athlete isn't great because their jump metric is x like there there's way more that goes into that and and we're all on the same page there but there we have we have been working to understand some of the links between positional demands and um how can we physically prepare that athlete what aspects do we feel um link potentially one athlete being a performing at a higher level. And again, we know that it's a multifaceted approach, um, but understanding what we value as a staff. And that was one of the big pieces that we sat down and, and we created um, our pillars. Like, what do we, and it's not, we're not, we're not giving anything crazy away here, but it's like, okay, we believe in obviously strength, power, speed. Um, what is our nutrition and wellness approach? And each one of those subject matter experts, like Lad, Roland, Mike has, has, that they've already had their systems and processes in place, but now how can we evaluate and provide them better insight to the direction each individual athlete should take? Like what I always talk, uh, talk about like throwing up that red flag within training and saying, okay, we provided this stressor. What is our end goal of change? And did we create that change? And so as we, um, look into uh, it that's great setting for like college athletics where you've got potentially 46 weeks with the athletes out of the year you you know like at texas i knew what every guy had done almost the entire year versus here you might have the guys for only 10 weeks you're trying to evaluate them for the first like they they, they might have taken three months off and they show up and you're like okay our testing and monitoring has to be on point because if we don't know where you were where you are now we've got to do, fly blind for a little bit to try and determine what's appropriate. Like we, it's ha, go as fast as you can without going too fast. And so that's where a lot of the pieces, the, like what you said, Nordic understanding, a lot of the force plate testing, um, that, again, that, there's so many uh, metrics out there at this point that, that you can get lost in the weeds a little bit, but understanding that again, linking back to the, the triphasic approach of, and in and, and my thesis, what I was doing in my master's program was rate of force development through um, counter movement jump. And, and I was fortunate enough, again, let's link all of our previous experiences into what we're doing now, uh, but fortunate enough to, to dive into some of those eccentric, isometric, understanding the force curve, even just kind of taking a quick glimpse at it and seeing what we see left to right things along those lines, the time it's taking for that athlete to load up to achieve that jump. 
uh, how we can monitor all those things. And then especially once we get in season, it's more about um, fatigue management really is what it is, right? And that's where the auto regulation piece comes into play. We've used jump heights. We've used um, comparing that to their best effort, comparing a, a squat jump to a counter movement jump. Like all of those um, uh, uh, have been used in the past to determine what an athlete needs, right? And, and we understand, especially in the sport of, of American football, I threw in the American football there for you. Uh, <laughs> no, conf- no confusion. <laughs> is there are so many different positional demands that we need to understand what each of those or guys or, or players are going to be asked to do on a day-to-day, weekly, um, and even play-to-play basis because the, the skill differential is, is so drastic. And so, again, I, th- I think for us it's using our testing and monitoring to – well, number one, we have to be able to have actionable data from it. Like we don't want to just collect data. We don't want to just house that. Um, we've got to understand what makes certain positions better than others. Um, and then it's obviously here we're creating buy-in because we want to make sure that you've got, it's the same everywhere, but making sure that the athlete gives effort in their testing because if they're not, then we're kind of swimming upstream because I have no way to evaluate one test for that athlete to the next or compare it to their position group. And, and I think that's led us to everyone in our group, especially sports performance, but it started to expand is speaking the same language and understanding some of these red flags for an athlete. Um, and when it's time to pull back because, and again, pull back, that's kind of our last resort is how can we help them recover more um, and create that unbreakable athlete. But again, with the time restraints that we have, sometimes it is a, hey, this guy's going to go through a, a large increase in their loading. What can we do from a recovery, like soft tissue modalities? Are we making sure that structurally they're in alignment because their X, Y, or Z test changed by this much? Um, and seeing that athlete from the holistic big picture view has, has been huge for us as a staff evaluating what we value, but then also it's led into us being even more concise with our testing and monitoring of our athletes as we progress throughout the year. I was reading an interesting paper that I don't think it's been published, but came out in, it's going to come out in JSCR from Chris Bishop and the guys over here at Middlesex uh, University. And his group had, had, and I think it was Matt Jordan and bit of an an a list of strength and conditioning on the on the uh publication list but they were talking about potentially sensitivity being something that often gets overlooked when it comes to um when it comes to measures especially jump measures and people potentially persevering with metrics and parameters that maybe not sensitive to what to change and to identify what the actual the meaning of the test right is that something that you go through and is there anything on that kind of on that level that you've potentially moved aside or incorporated it? Um, I would say that we're still probably on the earlier side of this thing. Um, uh, We've, we actually, Matt spoke to our group and he did a phenomenal job and, and his discussion actually really hit home for me on the, like some metrics are occasionally, not occasionally, but they're consistently, I don't want to say inaccurate, but they're kind of all over the place. So you can't pinpoint and say this is really valuable because if it's not consistent, then we're going to run into problems. And so um, his materials definitely helped me and us as our sports performance staff try and kind of weed out, like potentially you could throw up a flag on an asymmetry, but it turns out when you really break down what that asymmetry is kind of spitting out week in and uh, week in and week out, it's it's not as valuable as you think it is because it's all over the place all the time. Mm-hmm. So, so. So the one thing you mentioned in the in the article with the six physical performance qualities and the nice little diagram in there that you provided as well, and I think you've mentioned a couple of them just in your in your last answer there. Would you mind just taking us through those six and what what each one actually means and why you think they are the the important pillars that you would look to improve in a in an athlete? Yeah, I I I would agree that those six in some form or another combination create pretty much every single athletic movement um, goal process um, that an athlete can produce on the field. So 
they're broken up into three energy systems. So we're talking oxidative, glycolytic, um, ATP, creatine, phosphate. And obviously our understanding of the, um, especially a team sport like repeat sprint athlete, how critical each one of those are, right? So that oxidative system and its ability um, to replenish that ATP, creatine, phosphate. And so, again, it's, it, this is all about fitting the, the training program that you're going to implement uh, based on the context that you have available. So if you talk to Cal, Cal's going to say, oh, we're going to do block periodization for all of these. Well, he's got his athletes 40-some weeks out of the year potentially, right? And so that's going to be a different model than a group that potentially only has 8 to 10 weeks with their athletes out of the year. And obviously, as you progress through um, – different levels of sport that that availability to them changes pretty drastically uh, so that that to me that repeat sprint ability is truly your end goal for the majority of sports not team sports now obviously if you have a an individual event you've got a track and field or a swimming and that's where cal is prior to um the, writing the book the majority of his information was coming out of track athletes and swimmers because it's ultimately them versus the pool or the track and there's not as many factors obviously in team sport we understand there's so many uh, different aspects going on at once Um, but beyond the energy systems then you're going to have strength power and speed and so obviously depending on positional demands we're going to ask our athletes to achieve um, different strength numbers Uh, we're using power from a i mean obviously force velocity approach and then our speed component um, is is kind of, I don't want to say the icing on the cake because it's ultimately what we're chasing after. Uh, but again, like w- if we're only going to see our athletes at certain times throughout the year um, and they're getting a lot of that from on field, then we're going to focus on the, the, the pieces that are going to move the needle that they're probably not getting. And so I think, I think that's really important. But again, it, it entirely depends on on the context of the of the situation that you're in, of how you would program uh, to achieve each of those, and then obviously the next few articles is going to be the the testing and monitoring of each of those. Like this first one was kind of like general overview, understanding what you value, and then we're going to get kind of in depth on okay, even beyond those six pillars, it's even the the kind of foundation of it is movement, right? So again, it goes back to that F nor piece if that athlete can't express certain, I guess you could say, common joint angles in gait, whether that be walking, like walking is a real easy one to measure, then what are the aspects that we feel we need to um, address, I guess you could say, with with that athlete moving forward? Do they need a, a slightly different approach because X muscle isn't doing its job in this phase of gait? So how can we get them to do that is it a biomechanical issue is it a i mean is it a muscle firing issue whatever you want to call that what are the aspects that we're implementing to to create that change because if that movement's better then all the other aspects are better too i've got a question on that but i'll, I'll just revisit the the repeat, repeated sprint ability side of things for someone that's working in a sport that their time constraints are, are quite heavy that there's there's limited time with your athletes to develop those kind of things and they're pretty structured throughout throughout the year how do you go about addressing that given that it's that it's so key in not only american football but other collision sports p- particularly um how do you go about addressing that uh i, I wish we had the, the perfect <laughs> answer at this point um no our, our strength staff does an incredible job here with the limited time they have so it, um it's it's very impressive and it was the same thing i experienced at texas honestly um with uh, yancey mcknight and his staff and what they were doing like we don't need necessarily the catapults the gps um to tell us what a player needs to do their programming is on point to the to the to the point where it ultimately just it those gps units serve as a the metrics serve as a um kind of review of what we did and it's usually on par so i would say from from the three energy systems repeat sprint um i would say the oxidative system is going to be 
trained, not specifically like it would in a block periodization, but you're going to, it's going to be more of a repeat sprint ability. It's not going to be, we're not going to go out and train the glycolytic system and run 300 yard shuttles because that's, that's not beneficial to them. Like these athletes need to produce intense amounts of force and energy in a matter of four to six seconds, maybe sometimes as short as two to five seconds, whatever it is, and then recover from that. And so it's probably we're going to in the in the couple of weeks that we have with them, we're going to make sure that we're preparing them for those demands, not just necessarily the long, slow volume pieces like that. So I'm guessing there'll be plenty of people listening to this who are under similar constraints that you are. And it'd be great to get some potential examples of how you may go about that practically and, and really prepare those players, not only your players, but people you've prepared in the past for those those key three, four second bursts before that recovery the subsequent recovery right i i think the more you the more you look at it the more i'm going to err on the side of quality training right so if we're looking at um velocity drop off in the weight room velocity drop off on the field it's going to be we don't want to see probably ever greater than a 10 percent drop if that's starting to drop off by more than 10 then we're training in a fatigue state and now there are there are times where you have to do that at the end of a long drive at the at the end of a game you're going to be under fatigue and we understand that but our training we want to try and i always compare it to the forces you might see on a back squat that are long and slow versus a depth drop jump well the impulse of that depth drop is going to be significantly higher even though the total force potentially across that four second span of that back squat and the load on it might come out to be similar right? They might, I mean, somewhere in the ballpark, right? And so we want to look at the impulse and that quality of training of that foot striking the ground with limited time. And then how can we, once they can do it once, can we get them to do it repeatedly? So you can just slightly alter your rest times. You can alter the number of days a week that you're hitting high speeds. Like early on, we're going to have days designed specifically for acceleration change of direction, um, some type of volume training, whatever that looks like early on in the season, it's going to early on in the off season, it's going to be a little bit more of the conditioning side of things. And then as we gear it into season, it's going to be more of a repeat sprint ability, right? It's almost like a, a high to low approach, but then as you get closer to the season, especially if you have time with these athletes, it's going to be more like a high to moderate approach where it's it's your lows aren't really lows anymore because when you're going to practice three days in a row those athletes have to be prepared for those demands or it's four days in a row whatever the structure of um the team setting that you're in or athlete setting so let's dive into the strength pillar that you spoke about because that's i think that's where we're going to get um some great info on the on the triphasic training stuff just tell us a little about the triphasic training because you're obviously the, the co-author with, with Carl. Firstly, how did that come about? Because I'm I'm interested. I suppose, did speak to Carl about it, but it's be great to get your um, your take as well. Yeah, so Ben Peterson, who's with 49ers, did the original with Cal. Yeah. And then, yep, I did the the second, like the lacrosse version while I was at Denver. Yeah. And really, really the big pieces of it uh, is the six, the physical components uh, of training that we were talking about. But then it's how can we take what Cal has done and restructure it slightly to fit into uh, what's the context that we were in at Denver. And so I think, I think the, the most important takeaway uh, with that triphasic is people want to talk about just the eccentric, the isometric and the concentric and say, okay, well, that's the triphasic. But the way that I look at it, yeah, those are the muscle action is a component of the triphasic system. But when you really get into it, there's that modified undulated block within the week that he's going to do and the block periodization. And so that block periodization piece is going to break up each of those physical performance qualities and train them based on how long they're retained within, within the athlete's body, right? So when that athlete throws up that red flag, if we're training strength, that if we're, if again, the morphological change that we're talking about within myosin, actin, those changes, those adaptations are retained for a greater amount of time than if we're training something like speed that might only be a couple days. And so understanding that, like the eccentric 
isometric concentric pieces are obviously key like people understand that and implement that the most but then realistically it's shifting into that power and the speed where he's saying i created this throw up the red flag for mice and acting getting stronger creating more of an elastic tensile system and now can i do that under high velocity conditions which are going to be required at sport and so again again with with the setting, the majority of time is going to be spent in that strength component because you never know what athletes have done when they get here. And so you're going to spend a significant amount of time there making sure that, um, and the, the motor learning from eccentric and isometric that's, that's available. Obviously those are going to play a key role as well. Um, but that's what, those would be my biggest takeaways from, from the triphasic. And then when we actually get into the strength, obviously like it depends how many days a week you're you're training at things along those lines, but typically about two days or so of the eccentric training is is going to give you a pretty good stimulus. And same with ISO. And realistically, it's it's going to be just fitting it into the system um, that you have available, right? And so it's understanding, okay, our athletes have this time frame to get to here. How are we building them to get to that, right? Within whatever. St- slope you have to take in order to make that happen one thing i think is potentially well firstly it looks cool on instagram which instantly makes me think that it's been taken on by the fitness industry potentially and potentially bastardized a lot of the time and that's the oscillatory training would you Give us a little bit of an insight into your thoughts around that particular method and where it does actually fit and it, even potential ways that people get it wrong because I'm sure there's hundreds of them from what you see online. Yeah, yeah, I would say, I would say again, based on the context of, of how you're implementing it, we've done it before in the strength block. So again, if you've got three days a week in that triphasic system that you're training, Days one and days three are going to be whatever muscle action you're in. And then that middle day is going to be a reactive day. So like we're going to potentially do timed sets there. We're going to say, okay, how can we match the weight room to the demand? So if we say that that reactive day is five seconds, instead of saying we're going to get, um, we're going to do sets of three to four, we're going to do five seconds, get as many reps as you can. And now you're creating that concept of, push, pull, push, pull, push, pull. And now you're creating that tension, that strength that we're talking about, which is ultimately the goal of that triphasic system. And so what an oscillatory is, is taking that and you're just shortening the range of motion. So in a strength program, we're going to typically do that in a disadvantageous position. So you're going to train that in your weakest range of motion. Right. And so if it's five seconds, it's push, pull, push, pull, push, pull, push, pull, and then finish with a full rep as fast as you can with the concept of, let's say I've got 80 percent on the bar and I'm just using a bench press because I'm right in front of a camera. (laughs) Well, if I'm doing my reps, really, realistically, 80 percent is only 80 percent at my weakest point. Right. A one RM is really just how strong you are at your weakest position. So if you start to change that range of motion, that bench press, obviously you're going to get stronger. Like that's why people do three board bench, right? Because you can move more weight, get more of a nervous system response. Obviously there's many reasons for shoulder health too, but that push, pull, push, pull puts them at that sticking point for the entire five seconds. So now you're talking about training strength in their weakest position. And we can apply the same thing with isometrics. We used to do that like with our priming isometrics even in the strength block, we'd put them in a really low position as low as they could challenge hip, knee, ankle in a good, like deep flexed range motion. Okay. Let's do some type of pin pull. Then as you progress through the blocks, you can switch that oscillatory into more of an advantageous position. So now it's going to be more about speed, right? Or you can be in a, what we would call a critical joint angle. And that would be the same with the isometrics for the pin pull, where we're going to place you in the position, um, kind of similar joint angles that you're going to be in, either it be like max velocity or acceleration and press into the ground as hard as you can and recreate those forces. And so that would be the progression. Again, the, the ultimate goal of, of the entire system is 
um, this this thought process of contraction and relaxation, antagonist and, and agonist functioning together. And there's a huge component for motor learning, right? So if I'm flexing my bicep, my bicep has to contract, but my tricep has to relax in order to allow that to happen. And so that ABC firing pattern is basically big fire by the bicep, and then it's, okay, the tricep's going to decelerate because it's like your brain saying, oh, I don't know if I'm fully comfortable with moving at this velocity into this range of motion. Okay, I'm going to slow it down, and then your bicep retakes over and does kind of the fine controlling motor from there. And so the goal is is to, that's why eccentric to iso to concentric, and then power and speed, which those are the pieces that are commonly left off because we're focused on the strength aspect, is that ABC firing pattern is most changed from high velocity pieces. Like that was what I ended up doing my thesis on. And it was, it was really helpful for, for me understanding my, um, my view of triphasic because I literally, I took every single, um, phase eccentric ISO reactive power and then speed and looked at, I attempted to look at originally, now this is grad school. So you got to take it with a grain of salt, but (laughs) I attempted to look at force plate and then compared like a quad to hamstring. Now you've got, again, I was young, you got a, some biarticular muscles in there that that's like, okay, well, how are we determining what they're really doing without really getting into this? And so the agonist antagonist piece, the goal was to try and say with skill learning of this speed training program, did we create a change in that relaxation? Because that's kind of that old school thought of, uh, who was it, Metviev? I, I think if that's how you say his name, if, if the five classifications of an athlete in that fifth level, the only difference for them was how fast they could relax their antagonist. And so that was kind of the thought process of it is, can we get this athlete to relax that muscle that's potentially decelerating that action to a greater extent? And then, I mean, that leads down to a ton of different rabbit holes of motor learning and pieces along those lines. But those would be the two, um, kind of my opinions for or reasonings and implementations for that oscillatory. So you're thinking disadvantageous for strength. And again, it's, it's, you're spending that time in your weakest link. So now everything across the chain is getting stronger for the movement. And then you have that advantageous where, okay, now it's about speed and that critical joint angle and the amount of times that I, my body is going to go through this joint action or movement as close as I can, and again, we know we're never going to recreate it in the weight room, but as close as I can to help fortify the skills that I'm developing on the field. Is there any particular exercises that that would benefit from being in that disadvantageous position? You use bench press an example, but is there any other examples that you could give that maybe a little bit more... Um. Early, using your environment, for example. Yeah, early on in in the strength training, you could do it for a step up. Like we okay. do bottom half step ups, and so what we would do is, and again, it, it and when you get into timed reps, it, it's a step ups are a tougher thing to coach. But you want to make sure you're driving through the foot that's on the bench. But we would have them um, once they got up to halfway, and it's kind of an arbitrary. They'd think, "Can I pull myself back down?" And that's mm-hmm. kind of the cue at all of this is push, pull, push, pull, push, pull, even on the full range of motion reactive training that we're doing, we're thinking push all the way up and then pull all the way down. And again, the the time sets, and that's what Cal found is the time sets created a huge change in that number of reps done per second. Interesting. And that would just be a coach just shouting out the seconds that would be a right. timer yeah yeah you could have a timer yeah. if you've got i mean if you've got help obviously if you break your groups up you can count it out loud um whatever however you want to approach that but then you can get into the different pieces too of okay um and this is all like nick stuff from the fnor but you start to look at you want to use whether it's a coach counting an external count versus an internal count whether you're doing an eccentric or an isometric and so it, it gets, you can start to get really deep. Now that might be, uh, again, how, how much you trust your athletes to count. Cause we know whatever we write on a page and, and we're letting them count. We know it's pretty much getting cut in half, <laughs> yeah. but I know I can't really say anything. Cause I'm the same way. I'm like, Oh, five second eccentrics. It's like, humans. okay, right. It's I was humans, like, Oh, that was yeah, about yeah. two and a half seconds. So. <laughs> 
So and you mentioned isometrics there a couple of times. And just from my speaking to Alex Natera, Danny, Danny Lum, isometrics has gone mental yeah. of how much people value them. Again, bad example, but you go on social media and just isometrics are everywhere. Right. right. So from from your perspective, obviously they have a place in the in the triphasic system, but on a on a bigger on a on a larger larger level, how much of us how much of a place do they hold in your program, and where do they actually fit? Yeah, I, I would say that it's one of the probably and and it, like you said it's becoming extremely utilized but again i think looking back at even the way cal did it, obviously triphasic is going to have a huge isometric component but what people don't see is in his gpp phases where he was doing the oxidative glycolytic atp creatine phosphate kind of gpp model that he has is that he was doing isos there as well so we'd start off with like the five minute ISOs, um, and honestly, like the Jay Schrader approach, right? So long five duration, minutes. yeah, five minute ISOs, where it's just like hold a split squat for as long as you can. Yeah. And so we'd use those for more of our oxidative, and then as we got into our what we would quote unquote call glycolytic, we would have thirty second holds. And so again, a lot of tissue prep too. But let's say you're doing. And, and it'd be our chance to intro some oscillatory stuff too. And again, I know you can see this, so I'm going to use a bench press example, but maybe 55 to 60%, you're holding for 30 seconds right here. And then you've got 10 seconds and then we're going to go to a lower body single leg exercise. And then you're going to come back and do 30 seconds on the other arm. And then you're going to, so you're creating, you end up about 16 reps of 30 second ISOs and you are, you're kind of moving throughout the body. Right, it's not like a total body isometric for one rep, which is what happens with the the isometric version of the triphasic, where you're going to look at strength gains. Um, and so again, that isometric served as a huge tool for me. That was actually that 30 second ISO is the first training session that I ever did. I I came in and visited Cal, and he's like, "Oh, you you played football in college? Like, go check this out. You should you should do this." And I made it through two rounds, and I was I mean I was done. I couldn't even like hold a weight at that point. And so um, I, I learned very quickly about, about those ISOs. But I think, <laughs> I, I think exactly what you're saying. I think it's, it's, it has grown tremendously in, pop, in, in popularity. And, and I think one of the reasons is, is you, can, you can apply it in so many settings. Like what we like, you talk about pain management for an athlete that's returned to play. Okay, okay. If we can have that reduced effect for forty-five minutes, then why would we not hit some type of ISO there before we go? If it's going to create better, more pain-free movement, that's not going to be a compensation pattern. Then let's do it. If you're focused on tissue resiliency, then now we're we're talking about longer ISOs, that thirty-second, where now you're driving more into that tendon, right? And and those pieces, and then you get into the all the way into the more complex where it's like even in dynamic movement there are some muscles that are acting in an isometric fashion while others are acting dynamically so now you've you've covered the entire spectrum and obviously the the opportunities that i had with cal and seeing it done there but then moving on to denver where this is where i was introduced to more of like some of the even longer duration there's a really cool study um that's basically 20 minutes of isometrics and this is kind of where that the the glute layering stuff came from it was all from Fnor and nick is how can we create change in hip extension firing right so obviously cows got rpr and and that was my first introduction to okay hip extension firing how can we create an alteration to it like nervous system changes adjustments however you want to reflexes things along those lines and then now we're looking at it from more of a biomechanical side of things. So, so the study was like you're loading those isometrics, body weight or whatever you can maintain for 20 minutes, but then you're looking at brain activity with it. And you're saying, okay, after I think they did it for six days, I'd have to go back and look at it. It's a long time ago that I read it, but it's like six days of the, of the study. But not only was – their like act brain activity increased during the motion or during their ISO, but it increased during their gait as well. So now you're looking at creating actual like 
plasticity when it, within the brain with an isometric. That's not super heavy loaded. That doesn't blow the guy up, but we're creating change there. And then now we're, we've even gotten into the rabbit hole. If you haven't seen um, Sean Sherman and Square One and, um, and Dan Fichter introduced me to it. He's out of uh, Rochester, New York. Uh, but Sean's system is entirely based around isometrics. So he is, and again, this is, this is a, a huge piece for how we're addressing pain at times is we are, when the foot hits the ground, Sean will talk about this, this whole, the whole body hits the ground, right? Your left foot hits the ground, every joint in your body, we know equal and opposite forces. And so if there's a joint in there that your brain is slightly, I, I guess you could say it threatened by is probably the best way of saying it, then potentially that nervous system is going to shut down. Anytime your, your nervous system perceives threat, it's going to start to shut down. And now he's created a system that's going to allow you to go in, determine where that joint is, and then use an isometric to just simply tell the brain, oh, hey, I need to organize myself and this shouldn't be a threat because there's no true structural damage here. And so that's, a, that's another system that's, that's been pretty incredible and it's built on the understanding of gait joint mechanics. How can we apply those? And so again, it, it's... it's being, I'll return to this all the time, being surrounded by really incredible people and then starting to even just kind of create your own web of, okay, they, this this system taught me this and you can relate it to this system here. And that's really, that's really what it's all about to me. Just taking it on another level down to the, down to the, the power side of things in the preparation for this, I read a nice little article blog that you'd, um, that you'd publish on the importance of just, well, mention the importance of understanding physics when it comes to power development would you give us a bit of an insight into your thoughts around that and why you think understanding physics is important for for this area because that may scare a few people i saw that and i got scared (laughs) (laughs) yeah i think i think um so max schmarzo and i we've done three books now we did the power development book we did the isometric book and then we did the the most recent one the forces king book and, and that Forces King was an attempt to introduce physics, but it's, it's things coaches know already, right? It, it's the example, the one, that, the one that I use all the time is, is the context. We talked about it earlier, the back squat, the force, if you take the total sum of forces compared to the sum of forces from, from a, a depth drop, maybe they're similar, maybe they're not. But the concept of is the time that it takes for those forces to be Uh, realized by the body are completely different. So understanding impulse and the amount of time available for the activity to complete. So we start talking about elite level sprinters that, I mean, you're, I mean, you're talking about a 10th of a second where, okay, that's great that you can back squat three times your body weight. Great. Two and a half times, whatever your standard is. But if you're doing that across a four second window and your foot's on the ground for this long, what does that really mean for a transfer of training? And that's really the, the, the goal of that physics side of things. And it's the same with the power is how can you help transition that transfer of training from, and, and again, it goes back to even the triphasic, eccentric, iso, reactive are, are great and that's important, but it builds the foundation for those upper level pieces that are going to be um, – more indicative of performance on the field right and so that's that's kind of without going too in depth on some physics here right now i i think that's really the the take home from that is is understanding impulse and the time that athletes have available and the tension that's required across your body when your foot hits the ground is your ankle um stiff and that's like a a chris corfus and cal thing and and all of the stuff that he's done is is incredible but it's like the, we saw some tremendous changes in max speeds just from addressing the ankle complex. So looking into like Chris Corfus and all of his material, uh, creating, again, we talked about a guy, like we had one of these guys um, in the past um, when I was at Texas, he could, he could squat a house, but his speed, for some reason, he kept increasing his squat and he wasn't getting any faster. And then we started looking at some film of him. And you see that when his foot hits the ground, you we're going to talk ball of foot, right? Push through, um, not not on the toe. But when he hits the ground, his whole foot collapses and his heel ends up hitting the ground. And now all of a sudden you're like, 
okay, well, if this is the weak link in his time available to complete that action, then we do a couple ankle, ankle exercises. Like we did some heavy ISOs, again, relating back to popularity of ISOs, but we did like heavy foot ISOs off of a pit shark. And we did, um, like, and Chris has a million exercises for this, but, um, and then we were doing, we used the K box to eccentrically load that ankle. And then we focused on positive shin angles and, and, Three weeks later, I think I've got the data. He hit his fastest speed by, I think it was like three miles an hour. And so it was just like, okay, like the force was already there. He, it, He's not a bad athlete, but we we just needed to find a better way to evaluate where his weakest link is. And I think kind of come a full circle. That's kind of what, what that evaluation process is all about is what are the pieces that we feel that we can change and how are we evaluating those to to implement a system, right? If if I'm testing five different things, I might have 15 different systems running into each of those or total, probably 15 each is a lot, but <laughs> but you might have 15 different systems that you could pick from to reduce threat to the nervous system, to change. Um, and again, we're, like we're focusing a ton on, on the nervous system and sensory input right now. Again, that's, that's Dan Fichter, Sean Sherman, all those guys have been incredible and instrumental in, in progressing everything that I thought I knew from, oh, like sets and reps and, and triphasic and eccentric and power and all that. But it's like, if your input is better from like, you're, th- you're talking like what well, I think it's cerebellum has 80 axons coming in and you have one leaving. Then if your input is better, what your body is perceiving through all of its senses, then your output's going to be more appropriate for what you're looking for. Okay. So just, just dive in that for a second. How are you looking at that and trying to improve that input? Yeah, again, it comes down to a lot of the the testing and monitoring that we're using. Um, but we're, we're looking at, at, like, we look at the three, um, like, vestibular system we're going to look at. We're going to look at the visual system. And then we're going to look at the proprioceptive system, right? And so without, like, without giving too much of, of their info away, those are kind of the three major pieces that we'll evaluate on a day-to-day basis. And then we've created warm-ups based on our testing protocols to um, create change within what we're seeing, right? So it's like, oh, we're seeing this issue. Um, we're going to slide you um, into this bucket. We're going to slide you into that, however that fits um, and however we can address that, I guess is probably the most politically correct okay. answer I can give right now. No, that's cool. That's fine, mate. So one last, <coughs> excuse me, one last thing. One thing you mentioned and it is pretty clear to anyone listening is when it comes to power development, that quality is yeah. the, the the driver, is the goal versus versus quantity. Methods that you would employ to ensure quality training, especially in this power development area. Yeah, I would say, I mean, if you have, obviously it depends on what you have available technology wise, but the drop off of, of a set even is, is really critical. And again, like you go back all the way to Hank, um, Krajinov got been fortunate to listen to him speak. He was close with Cal, uh, quite a few times. And he talks about that 10% rule, like his sprinters never got to a 10% drop off. And you know, it's, it's the, the age old comment that, oh, coaches are always X amount of years ahead of the research. Well, naturally all of this research now is coming out that shows if athletes train to high velocity drop-offs that they're shifting into more aerobic type fibers. Again, that, that red flag that's being thrown up isn't about that two to five seconds maximal intensity. It's about, oh, I can just keep going for longer. And depending on the sport, that might be valuable, but for the, for the athletes that we deal with, that, that that's not valuable for us. So I think the, the power book that Max and I did, um, does a really good job of, of, of laying this all out, but it's really, it, I mean, drop offs within the set, you could do drop offs within total workload. Let's say you've got three reps and you have that scheduled. You're going to keep going on those three reps until you hit your X percent, whether it's five, eight, ten. If you want to go 20, great. Hope we play you that week. <laughs> um, but it like looking at that and understanding the recovery time, again, you're never going to mimic what we do on the field in the weight room. We get that. But from an energy system development and demand, we can still create if 
if we have 50, and this goes back to Cal's time sets, if we have 50 efforts of five seconds in a day, that's much different than doing the same number of reps at, at 10 reps per set. Like that's, that's not even an appropriate stimulus and, and your intensity is going to have to be lower too on the, on the load. And so understanding the adaptations that you drive, but another way to do it, like we've done it with only jump mats before where a guy, let's say he's doing his pin pulls, he's doing his, um, major exercise, whatever it is. And then you're going to mix in your French contrast. So you've got your, um, let's say it's hurdle hops, weighted, um, jumps and then you have your accelerated and then let's say they've got a minute and a half to do their ankle exercise that we've used for the day and a hip prehab ish type exercise they're going to come over and we're going to do one of our jump mat tests and we're going to say okay you've decreased by this much this set we want to let's say they drop by three percent well that goes into okay if we have an eight percent drop for the day you've got another set and until they hit that eight percent drop then you're like, okay, we can move on to the next block. And what's interesting is you find out who has that capacity to hit those high intensity efforts over and over and over again. Cause you have some guys that go for eight sets and, mm-hmm. and it's like, oh, that's incredible that you can continue to hit that high um, impulse or whatever we want to call it intensity over and over and over again. And then you have some guys that burn out after two or three and whether you want to call that a, Maybe there's fatigue that day. Maybe there's an underlying issue or um, the, the oxidative system isn't clearing um, as quickly as it could. So maybe they need a slightly different, um, I don't want to say regress, but a different program to address a, an issue that's in that repeat sprint ability where you're seeing all of those six probably play together at a high level. Which one do we need to attack for them? Superb. Well, I've taken you three three minutes past the hour, and you're going to have a girlfriend who's shouting at you <laughs> <laughs> in a second for uh, for for me taking up your, the time on a potential little bit of a little bit of time off. So, Matt, where can people find out a little bit more of the stuff that we've spoken about today? The stuff you've done with Max, which is I'm sure that's pretty superb. The articles that you've got coming out on your website or are on your website and social media stuff. Yeah, I think. Um... I mean, I don't, I don't post a whole lot on social media at this point. Um, but the, the website, the it's vandykestrength.com is probably the best place to search through. Um, it's got links to all of these different, like there's articles on auto regulation that we've done in the past, what we spoke on uh, that we did at Denver. Uh, there's triphasic eccentric isometric components. There's presentations on athlete monitoring. Um, Yancy and I spoke at the NSCA, um, coaches in 2020. I think that's, there's a link on there for that. Um, there's a, a CSCCA, this is from like six years ago now, but on, on triphasic. So I, it's website is probably the, the best place and either articles or blog is going to be where you're going to pretty much find everything we talked about today. Superb. Well, I'm going to let you get off and hopefully not get a telling off from your girlfriend, <laughs> but uh, I appreciate you, you joining me on a Friday afternoon and uh, giving up an hour of your time. Thanks, mate. Appreciate it. Keep in touch. Thank you very much. Yes. Cheers, Matt.